There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Nick. I'm the development team leader, Picnic Software. Um, today's presentation is developing a flexible and scalable application. Um, I'll get into the details in a second. This is the Picnic team. There's nine of us. Uh, five of us are presenting today. I have a brief disclaimer. <laughs> Do we need to tick a box or anything? Yeah, you all, uh, I'll, I'll come around for you to sign. So <laughs> right. Just step it. Fingerprints, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's enough, you can watch the video. <laughs> but no, we're, we're here. Alrighty. Okay, so here's the agenda. Um, I'm going to introduce the app and the tech. Um, Andrew's going to talk about infrastructure, then we'll go on to deployment and scalability, then we'll cover um, how we do our sort of permission system um, with Neo4j, uh, and Baz will uh, talk about client-side tech, and then I'll come back in to talk about just our just general development workflow. Okay, so what do we do? Um, Picnic is an ISV. Um, we basically have one main application, and it's a workflow collaboration tool. Um, we have a, we have partnerships with large businesses, and we operate in the advertising and marketing sector. So that that's the domain. Um, the domain's not really that relevant. Um, and our customers are primarily large retailers, so just stores that sell things. Um, our app boils down to a media library and coordinating inputs into that library and coordinating outputs. So the inputs are photography and illustrations, graphic design, um, and just keeping people to deadlines to get those things done, uh, and then producing the advertising outputs, the advertising you see everywhere, billboards, catalogs, TV, radio. Um, yeah, and the media library was just high resolution files. Uh, this is part of our tech stack, <laughs> uh, but these are the, the main things. It's not important, we've, we've picked We've picked sort of the, the parts we want to talk about today. Uh, there's definitely more fiddlier bits than in here. Um, yeah. Alrighty. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to touch on is the, sort of the, the theme of this talk. What we're trying to, what we, what we have built and are continuing to build and evolve is a flexible uh, application. Um, so we've done, we've made architecture choices to support this. Um, yeah, and based on when we started, what we knew, what we knew we didn't know, and what we didn't know we didn't know. Um, yeah, so um, I was going to allow for questions at each section, so did anyone really want me to clarify something here? No, otherwise, um, yeah, at, at the end of each section you'll get a chance to, to talk, uh, to ask something specific to what we just discussed. Okay, so I'll hand over to our solution architect, Andrew. Hey, oh wow, there's lots of people. I, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about sort of our infrastructure. Um, and then that'll sort of link into what everyone else is going to talk about later on. Uh, so all of our production systems are in AWS. Um, when we started developing, we were looking at sort of other data centers um, and cloud providers. Um, but around the time that we were uh, just starting to get towards the end of development for this, um, AWS launched in Sydney. Um, most of our customers, uh, uh, oh sorry, all of our customers are in Australia and most of their users are in Australia, so it needed to be somewhere um, in Australia for the, the main data centre, um, as you didn't have that at the time. Um, and so we've got all of our servers and resources with AWS in Sydney uh, spread across both of the availability zones. Uh, so AWS uh, has about 28, I think now, availability zones, sorry, regions around the world. Um, hang on, that number sounds wrong. Sorry? Is, sorry, 28 availability zones split across a bit, a bit less than half that number of regions. Yeah, um, but Sydney has, has two availability zones, um, so we're split across that to make sure that we're fault tolerant. Um, and we're using, AWS has an enormous array of services um, and infrastructure that you can put together. 
Um, we're using probably a pretty standard subset of it at this point. Um, we make a lot of use of S3. Nick mentioned the media library. That's got a lot of uh, small and large assets going into it. Um, everything from the small JPEGs up to large videos. Uh, one of the nice things about S3, so S3 is really just uh, file storage. Uh, users are actually able to get pre-authenticated um, access to our S3, so we can allow you to upload your media straight to S3 with just a browser post. So as far as the user is concerned, they're just uploading a file through their browser, but that goes straight to S3 by passing all of our servers um, to get the media straight up there. Um, we're also using S3 for things like backups. Of loca so all our servers back up to S3 and then go out from there. Um, it's a nice spot to dump things. Um, S3 as well is just lo is located in Sydney, so they're all located there. Um, but we've put CloudFront in front of it. So CloudFront is AWS's CDN. CloudFront is both a front for our S3 data, so all the media is served from there, which means that uh, for customers who've got employees outside of Australia, they'll get all of their media served from a local distribution point. So even though AWS, for instance, doesn't have a um, compute centre here in Melbourne, they've got a CloudFront point of presence. So media files are served from somewhere much closer to people. There's many more CloudFront uh, points than there are um, AWS regions. Uh, we also also use CloudFront to serve all of our front end code. Um, so that's coming straight from CloudFront and not from our web servers. Uh, we're using Elastic Load Balancer. Um, you can see from the diagram here, that's sitting in front of our web servers. Um, unfortunately, we're using SignalR and WebSockets, which means it's actually running in TCP mode, so we can't, normally you could put it into HTTP mode and potentially do your SSL termination there, a whole bunch of interesting things. When it's in TCP mode, it's a bit more limited. Um, but it also manages uh, the DNS points to there and then distributes uh, load amongst our web servers. We also actually use that internally. Um, for instance, our Rabbit, Instant, our uh, RabbitMQ instances are load balanced through a separate uh, elastic load balancing um, set of servers. ELB is quite nice in that uh, it does all of the scaling for you. So you basically pay for an elastic load balancer uh, and it scales with how much it's being used. The presumption, I guess, is that you're paying for the services behind it so Amazon will get their, their money through that. But it's a piece of thing that you sort of, you turn it on and you route things through it and you I don't have to worry about it too much after that. Um, and it will obviously work across both availability zones as well. Uh, we're making fairly heavy use of EC2. Uh, the rest of the things I'm going to talk about that are part of our infrastructure are all actually just hosted on EC2 instances. So EC2 is sort of a compute part of AWS. Uh, so that's where you can just spin up a virtual machine. We've got a mix of Linux and Windows virtual machines. Um, and then they behave just like any other virtual machine. So we're on uh, using IS for our web services. Nothing very exciting there, so I'll keep moving. Um, we're using RabbitMQ for a bunch of uh, inter-process communication between machines. Um, so we've got a RabbitMQ cluster that spans the two availability zones. And as I mentioned before, load balance with Elastic Load Balancer. Um, we're using Event Store for our main data storage. Um, I gave a talk a couple of months ago about event sourcing, so I won't go into any of that tonight, but there's a video online of my alternate presentation from August or September if you want to know more about event sourcing. Uh, we're using RavenDB, um, again, just on an EC2, a set of EC2 instances, um, and it's our main sort of application database, and it also handles search for us. It's got Lucene built into it. Um, so we're able to serve most web requests from there. And we are just starting to add Neo4j to deal with um, our permissions. Oh, sorry, I should mention, Nick talked about RavenDB at alt.net in February. Uh, so there's a video of that online as well. Dave uh, is going to talk, be talking about Neo4j uh, tonight and how we're using that. So just to give an idea about how data sort of flows through our systems, writes come in through our web server gets written to Event Store. So for those of you who haven't seen the talk, basically Event Store stores, it's our canonical data store, and we store basically who did what and when in Event Store. And then we have Neo4j and Raven, Raven listening to the Event Store and updating the current state of the world as things happen. Um, Dave will explain the arrow between Neo4j and Raven when he does his talk.
Uh, so writes come in that way through event store. Reads are very simple. They just come into IIS basically and read the data either from Neo4j for hierarchical data or RavenDB for search and normal um, API requests. Uh, so one of the things that we've started to move towards is, well, one of the problems we've had is we started to treat our AWS servers a little bit too much like pets and not enough like cattle. So what we're trying to move to is that we've got a couple of uh, services which are deployed and those machines are long lived. So particularly Event Store, which is our canonical data store, um, and Rabbit, which is for our messaging. And they'll both be clustered across both availability zones. But what we're looking at is moving most of the other servers that, or the EC2 instances that we manage ourselves, to be disposable. So we spin them up, they talk just within their availability zone, so that it's a very simple uh, set of connections between them. And then when we have a new version of the code, we will just spin up a whole new set of instances and um, switch over to the new set and spin down the old set. And that's going to talk much more about deployment. Um, so that's sort of it from me. Hopefully that's been an okay introduction to sort of how all our pieces of tech fit together and then everyone else is going to jump into the interesting sections of those. So do people have questions at this point? Or is that how all been? It looks like your storage layer is, is disposable. So RavenDB and Neo4j. Oh. How are the stateful things disposable? Yes, good point. So event store is the canonical store of data. So everything that's in Neo4j and Raven uh, can be rebuilt from event store. Um, and at the moment, that's reasonably quick. So it's very likely that when we get to this model, we're not quite there yet, I've got to admit, um, that as those instances spin up, they will go to event store, rebuild themselves. Um, and that doesn't even matter if it takes a few hours or even a day, potentially. Um, where, because sometimes the data structure changes and it's just much easier to replay from event store. So that's how they become disposable. Um, and they also catch up independently from event store on in each availability zone in that scenario too. So you, you know we no longer need to have a cluster of Neo4j and a cluster of RavenDB. Those servers are all independent and they just all subscribe to event store um, and catch up independently. Yeah, so good, good, good question, yeah. yeah. Andrew? Yeah. Um, when you said it was reasonably quick, can yep. you describe reasonable? <laughs> um, oh, so at the moment we're sitting at about an hour Okay, uh, we're getting close to a million. Um, yeah, so I found it's actually not so much tied to the number of events as because we're doing batching. Yeah. It's more to do with like the number of documents in Raven, okay. that sort of thing. Like, like because you can you can get through a thousand events very quickly yeah. if all you're doing is uh, you've you've got an empty Raven, you read a thousand events and you do one right. That's really quick. So with the recent issues with Amazon Sydney last week, uh, which you may have been affected with, I don't know if you were. We were, yeah. Yeah. Um, would you have ever hey, Amazon or Azure? Uh, there was Azure. both. Oh right, I didn't. Both sorry, I didn't know about yeah. No, okay. Uh, I think Azure went on Wednesday and Amazon went on Thursday. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't go so down because yeah, our logging was. Yeah. You're lucky, but if you spread across both, will some parts of your system get hit? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but. Uh, so, how, would you ever use this in some form of disaster recovery? So, say if Amazon went completely, you could move to a yeah. completely different availability zone, or you could get the data out in parts of. So, Amazon what we've talked out. about is having uh, an event store cluster node in a different region, which would mean there's a complete copy of the event store in another region, and then in that scenario, we'd be able to spin up new instances of all of these in that other region. The copy of the data is already there. Uh, we might have to fiddle with our clustering requirements, so you know, tell them explicitly, hey, you're not split brain, it's okay to operate on your own. Um, but in that scenario, absolutely, we'd be able to um, spin that up there. Okay. Uh, the solutions <coughs> and the techni technical decisions you have taken uh, during uh, the designing for this solution, was it based on pain points before, or it's just green and you thought, thought yeah, probably this technology is nice, this decision is nice, and then yeah, oh, there's been lots of factors lead to all of the different decisions. Um, 
Did you have a particular thing you were wondering about? Was I, the event sourcing I, I, or the, the disposable uh, things? Or uh, I, the, the event sourcing mainly because uh, I wanted to know if it, if it really solved a problem that existed or it's just uh, uh, catching up with the, with the new terms that's happening in the industry. So because I want to know how valid is the solution compared to the problem. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think we did. It's a long answer. If you have a look at my other talk, I talked for an hour about that. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't want to go down that route tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, Joyce. Another question. Um, yeah. I saw MySQL in your stack there. You didn't really oh, talk to that. Sorry, MySQL is one of the things we are removing. Okay. So, at the moment, there's just a RDS instance of MySQL. So, it does its own. The RDS, sorry, is the relational data store so it's sort of a database as a service amazon does all of their cross available zone failover for you um we so we when we started we were actually looking at using in hibernate on top of mysql um and we've ended up using uh, raven and now near for j for that mainly raven for that part of it um so mysql is only used for one small thing at the moment and it's being replaced shortly because having rds instances for you know, a very small amount of data doesn't make sense. So, just say, that's very honest of me. Most people would just left it. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably could have. Yeah, but it's still there. I wanted to. Yeah, it was. In, it was in our list of what servers we've got. So, yeah. Oh, so Matt's going to talk, we're using Chef, yep. and Matt's going to talk a bunch about that, okay. so I'll leave that for him. What do you use for persistence for your RabbitMQ? Um, so that's just on an AVS um, image. I think we've got, uh, sorry, I don't refer to you, no, Matt. Do you? Right. Uh, are they on SSDs? I yeah. Think? Yeah. So they're just SSD backed. Yeah, um, provisional apps. Provision apps, yeah. Um, most of our Rabbit stuff, I mean, we've, we've set up all the high value in durable queues, but most things are on Rabbit for a very short amount of time. Um, the kind of processing we're doing now. So we've, we've had a bunch of things that were going over Rabbit and are now just event store. Um, so Rabbit over time, Matt's going to talk about what we do use Rabbit for, but Rabbit's actually got used less and less over time as event stores become more and more a core part of what we do. Cool. I want to add a just like a one minute summary to that question. Um, so we definitely did pick certain tech because it was um, interesting. So Event Store is possibly the example of that. Um, but other technology choices were made out of pain points. Um, so and and this is the sort of the phasing them out. So the MySQL is being phased out because it's um, it is a little bit of a pain point to manage. So that's why it's. We didn't talk to it, um, but it's going away and it's about to go away. Um, so in Hibernate and we had SQL Server before we had MySQL, that, that's gone away as well. So that was replaced with Raven. Uh, Event Store came in out of interest, but also we were doing sort of a, a CQRS approach, so command, query, response, segregation. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so we, were, we, we did have commands and events uh, prior to having an Event Store. So th that's how we sort of yeah, designed it originally, and that was all going over Rabbit. So then it was to phase out the commands, and it was to phase out the events being sort of these transient things uh, and keeping them in the event store. And the event store was, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, it wasn't, um, an, sorry, it wasn't like an unplanned or a, not a, not a prepared for choice. It really, it, it was made because we knew we would have customers whose requirements would evolve and because the sort of the sector we're in and because we were targeting businesses that were not using our app yet, we wanted to be able to sort of, uh, yeah, rebuild the app, sort of, yeah, grow the application more naturally. So, and that's, that's for how we achieve sort of the, the, the throwaway persistence layer with Raven so we can just replay it. Uh, and the, yeah, this sort of the, the being able to throw away those instances um, that, that's a current pain point for us because um, right now to sort of roll out a new version we have to sort of take the application offline and replay these things because we don't have this capability. So we've, we're, we're quite close to being able to do this, what Andrew discussed, 
um, where we've got sort of another instance run, another set of these um, servers running, and then we just switch to them, which Matt's about to talk to now. So I'll hand over to Matt. That's interesting. Oh, oh I'm gone. I'm holding it upside down, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and plus we're on the first slide. So, uh, there we go. Hi everyone, I'm Matt. Um, I'm going to talk to you about our deployment um, and our, and how we're scaling our application. Um, so as Brownie talked about, our server infrastructure is AWS. Um, and as we mentioned, it's largely a manual affair at the moment, um, but we're very close to getting it um, fully automated. Uh, our configuration management is done with Chef. Um, and for deploying our application, we use a combination of Team, City, and Octopus. Um, Chef, uh, I like this quote from Abraham Lincoln, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe because writing Chef recipes and cookbooks is a real pain. Um, but once you've done it and you've had them all tested, uh, you realise why you do it because you can deploy a server in a couple of minutes and it's always the same and it always works. Um, so Chef, uh, I think we chose it, it was a long time ago, I think we chose it because at the time Puppet didn't have, um, uh, wasn't able to deploy to Windows, don't quote me on that, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so each node is in an environment, um, they perform a role, each role has running one or more recipes and recipes are stored in cookbooks. Um, uh, everything in Chef is, is a text file basically, so you can uh, keep it all in Git, all your cookbooks, um, all your uh, environment configurations, all your role configurations. Um, and you can also keep your Chef server configuration in Git as well. It allows you to uh, requ uh, recover quite quickly from a, um, a disaster. Uh, Octopus Deploy. Um, so uh, we use this for our code deployments. It's Windows only at the moment. Um, I understand that Linux uh, tentacles are coming soon, I'm not sure when. Um, uh, it has the same kind of concept as, as Chef with environments and roles, uh, and you configure it with apps and you take snapshots of those apps which are releases. So um, each app has a deployment process, um, it's a list of steps that happen. Some steps you can say only happen on certain environments, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, basically what happens is we'll retrieve new get packages from our team city um, uh, installation and it has variables uh, that are associated with the application and they can be um, applied at the role level and the um, and the environment level and so the variable snapshot plus the new get packages equals the release. So you can store things like um, connection strings and secrets in, uh, in variables. Um, the kinds of steps that you can have, uh, you can deploy an IIS website, um, a Windows service. Uh, uh, there are other steps available as well. PowerShell steps we use a lot, um, are just basically executing uh, random hooks, well, not random ones, but, um, but hooks <laughs> that, are, that are appropriate to our build process, that sort of thing. Uh, you can do partial deploys, you don't have to deploy everything every time. If you just fix a spelling mistake in um, a HTML file, you can just deploy to your web servers. Um, and you can also do rolling deploys, we don't, um, but the, uh, uh, the feature is there if you need it. And it's easy to roll back generally, you just redeploy the last working release. Um, of course that doesn't apply when you do things like large um, data changes and things like that, but for code only changes it, it works. Um, so, as Brownie was talking about, um, this is our where we want to be very soon, blue-green deployments. The concept is that we would use Asgard um, to, uh, to manage our AWS infrastructure. So we'd bring up a new copy of our production infrastructure with Asgard. Um, we'd automatically bootstrap all of the, um, the instances against Chef and Octopus. Uh, they can, Chef and Octopus can both do pull um, deploys. We'd smoke test it. Then we add the green web service to the load balancer, take out the old ones, and then once everything's all running, we tear down the blue one with Asgard. Um, so that's uh, basically our deployment process. Um, I'm going to talk now about uh, basically our, our messaging system. Um, our requirements when we were choosing it were those mainly reliable and easy to manage. Uh, 
also easy to use. I uh, didn't want developers spending a lot of time on it. And low latency was, you know, um, a, of lower importance, but we didn't want it noticeably slowing down the, the application. This is what we looked at two years ago. We looked at N Service Bus, Mass Transit, and Rabbit MQ and EasyNet Q. Initially, we had Rabbit MQ and we wrote our own client. Uh, but that ended up being a bad idea. It got too complicated. We found an EasyNet Q and it, it just fit really well. So, yeah, we chose Rabbit MQ um, uh, after all of that. Uh, it's written in Erlang, it's maintained by Pivotal. Um, it runs pretty much exactly the same on Linux and Windows. Uh, it's very easy to administer. It has a web um, a console that you can go to if you install the, um, the plugin. Uh, there's a command line that can allow you to control the servers and the clustering, and all the configuration is in JSON. Um, so it's very easy to deploy. Uh, it supports clustering and failover. We're using durable and highly available queues. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, uh, it's a bit faster if you don't. Um, it can guarantee at least once delivery. Uh, it has various types of exchanges, direct fan out and topic. Um, and it supports uh, virtual partitioning, um, so uh, virtual hosts. And it also supports federation shoveling where you can um, federate exchanges to other exchanges in other, other clusters. So um, you could have a, another cluster in another uh, 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 Amazon region, if you wanted to. Um, right, so our setup is a cluster, of, as um, uh, Brownie said, it's a cluster of Rabbit and Q's behind ELB in the two AZs in Sydney. Um, you can use Har Proxy, that's really well documented and works really well. Uh, we just didn't, um, uh, we didn't have any need for it in production. Uh, we knew, used Mike Hadlow's uh, EasyNet Q library, uh, handles all the the RabbitMQ stuff, and uh, yeah, we don't even touch that anymore. Um, we hardly even think about uh, Rabbit and, and EasyNetQ. Um, so use cases. Uh, first one is uh, scaling of our long-running CPU and I/O operations. So things like file format conversion, um, videos can take a while, zip bundling, um, and producing PDF and InDesign files, that sort of thing. Um, we use a topic exchange. We've only got one topic at the moment. Um, but the way the topics work uh, with their namespace style, um, you could say have certain servers subscribe to a certain portion of the topic and other servers subscribe to other portions of the topic based on SLA or um, licenses that you might have, uh, that sort of thing. Um, subscribers are round robin by the broker, so one message gets delivered to this guy, one message gets delivered to this guy. They are isolated, they don't know about each other, there's no clustering. So scaling, we just bring up new instances, they connect to the broker, they start receiving jobs. Uh, the redundancy is provided by the multiple AZs and this has worked really well for us over the last two years. Um, the second use case is uh, basically distribution of um, messages to signal our clients. Um, so in-app notifications, um, in progress, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, when you say for example when you're converting a file it qu can take quite a while and you want to be notified you know when it's going to be finished and, and how long it's taking so each web server receives all the messages um, that go, go over uh, this exchange and the messages are delivered to users and groups via SignalR um, if um, a web server receives a message for which it doesn't have a user or a group uh, attached it can just drop the message um, and that's it. Have uh, we got any questions at all? What were the problems you ran into when you wrote your own library for Rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> um, Naivety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess we'd never done it before, and, it, um, and we're also new to, um, uh, to the message broker concept as well. So uh, we wrote a really complicated reconnection logic and, and things like that to make sure that we didn't lose messages. And, um, and then when we saw um, EasyNet Q, we just went, mm, this is rubbish, we'll just go with that. So Andrew's actually um, uh, submitted a couple pull requests to that project. To, I think um, one thing was fair work queuing uh, that we needed that didn't have, and uh, so he's done that. So we, you know, from time to time contribute, it, contribute to it, but really 
don't think we've really needed anything new for quite a long time now. It was, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I wrote the the previous ones. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all make you when I asked the question. <laughs> well, we took three stabs at it. Matt wrote the first one, then yeah. I did some extra changes, and then Andrew joined us at that time. And, and, he, yeah, that's and right. then we realised, oh, well, this is this is too hard. Well, it's, <laughs> we were basically reproducing something that existed at that point. Mm. Uh, yeah, and we did fail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long does it take you to get something? Uh, oh, um, I can talk to that later. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, Nick, Nick's got that in his um, process stuff, so, um, yeah. Well, not ask it again later. <laughs> it, de it, de <laughs> it depends, basically, but yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, what do you use to orchestrate multiple servers since using Chef for one for each particular server configuration? What are you using to connect them all? Uh, Oh, no, we're not. No, that's where we're trying to get to with the Asgard thing. So Asgard provides an interface to CloudFormation um, configurations. Uh, so no, we're <laughs> doing everything manually at the moment. Um, and we just bring up new ones when we need them and manually take them down with the console. So, yeah. Yeah. How, do you, how do you test your chef recipes at the moment? Uh, we have an internal server that we just bring up our VMware instances on, um, test them, make sure it all works, and then once that's right, then we'll bring up an instance in um, AWS, deploy it there, make sure everything works. That's basically it. Yeah. So once you've got Blue Green deployment, do you think you'd still use Octopus Deploy to deploy, or would the AMIs be coming up with the packages? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, we'll still use Octopus. So um, they'll just bootstrap themselves, and eventually they'll come up. I mean. Dep depending on the instance, it takes between, say, five minutes to an hour to, to build a new instance with all the things that we have to install on it, especially Windows ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'd say having Octopus as a step at the end of that, mm -hmm. where it just pulls the code it needs for the roles, it, it's, that's not a really long, like, it, it, it's not a really big time saver in the grander scheme of things. Do you have the secrets and passwords uh, in your deployment scripts, or is this all managed by the chef? And they are in um, uh, Octopus at the moment. So, no, we don't keep the secrets in chef. Um, uh, oh, except for some, the ones on the Linux boxes, um, they're in encrypted data banks. So. What about pre baking AMIs <coughs> so you don't take that long? <coughs> um, we do do th that for some things. Um, uh, I'm yeah. It's it's still the future at the moment for me uh, for this this new way of doing things. But yeah, so say our VPN servers, for example, they're all pre-baked. Um, so if they go down, we can bring up new ones as quickly as possible. How do you do your tenancy? Um, in the app. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's well with Rabbit, there's the vhost feature. So you connect. In your connection string, you connect to a, a VHost. So the um, the stuff that's to do just with the app and, and say like the um, uh, the signal R stuff that I talked about before, that's in one VHost. But then um, our media conversions, that's all in another VHost. It uses a slightly older version of our um, client stuff. Um, and so it talks a slightly different language, so to speak. Um, uh, and so we keep them separate. Um, so that's how we, we, we do that. But with the app itself, um, it's all, it's basically all tenanted in uh, Raven at this point. Um, we don't have, and there is no multi-tenancy supporting event store, is there, at the moment. Yeah, I think so that, that may be coming, it's on the radar. Isolation. Yeah, so, so we, yeah, we, we isolate the streams by appending the, the tenancy name to the front of the stream. And yeah, we parse that, that um, name. Yeah. Um, any other questions at all? No? Okay. Um, I think Dave's next. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'm going to put that blind down just a little bit before you go because I'm being blind. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. How's that? I can see. <laughs> uh, so I'm Dave. Uh, I trimmed my beard recently. So the photo's slightly old. But, um, I started a picnic about six months ago, um, and it's been lots of fun so far. So, 
Uh, I'm going to talk about our permission system, um, kind of, which sort of motivates why we're moving to Neo4j. Um, so I'll talk a bit about how we model permissions and how we currently implement them, um, and then go on to talk just briefly about Neo4j, uh, which is a graph database, if you don't know. Um, so like any permission system, really, the permissions are just tokens. Um, every uh, every entity in the system is identified by a good, um, and uh, so we've got you know folders, uh, jobs like approval jobs, um, all sorts of different entities. Each one has a good. The permissions are a combination of the good and a role. So, for instance, you might have uh, write permission on a folder. You might also have read permission on a folder. Um, so these, these are how we distinguish our permissions. Each user has a set of permissions and a permission check is simply, for my this current user, is the permission I need in the set of permissions I have. Um, so you could just store the permissions as a, as a list or a, a, a set. Um, we need a little bit more information because, uh, as mentioned, we've got the media library. So there's a set of folders. They can inherit permissions down the tree um, we want to be able to store relationships, relationships like that in the, the permission system. Um, so we, we actually represent it as a graph. Um, each user starts out with a single permission in their set of permissions, uh, which we sort of have this uh, pseudo role called me. Um, and then uh, to add a permission, uh, as events come in through the event sourcing system, we have a configuration which describes when this event comes in, we add, may add a particular relationship, like in this case, it might have been a, a, an approval job was created, uh, and so the current user then gets ownership permission on the approval job. Um, so that, that configuration just works with the event sourcing to build up the permission graph. Um, we don't just, as I sort of mentioned, we don't have just relationships between the me permission and actual permissions, we also have permissions elsewhere in the graph. So if you had write permission on a folder, it might also imply you have read permission on that folder. So we can represent that with a relationship between the write and the read permission. Um, and then checking for a permission isn't just checking for something in a set, it's checking whether, uh, oh sorry, yeah, whether there's a path in the graph from the user's me node to the permission that you're interested in. Um, so in this case, you can see there's no path between the me and the read permission. So this user doesn't have read permission if we another event comes along, introduces a new relationship where that user has now got write permission on the folder, uh, and we want to check whether they have read permission now, we can see that they do because there's a path through through the graph to that user. Um, so it's quite a general way to store our permissions, um, which which we've found in practice works quite well. Um, the the original implementation of this was done in Raven, um, which was just it, it sort of it, it speaks to. I guess the development process where you know we didn't introduce an extra dependency just because we sort of seemed like we could do it in Raven. We didn't want to add extra services on top, um, and so it was initially built in Raven. Um, and the way it was built was each node in the permission graph has a document in Raven, um, and that basically just lists which other permissions inherit that permission. So um, you can see from this graph the read permission is inherited. Uh, by the right, uh, if, right, yeah. So if you have write, then you have read. Um, so the read permission is inherited by the write permission. The write permission is inherited by me, and owner is inherited by me. So we have this simple graph. Obviously, these these are lists. Um, so you could have multiple permissions depending on the incoming relationships into a given node. Um, you can't query this directly, obviously, because if if you want to know does this, does this user have the read permission? And I just look at this read document, all I see there is the write permission. And so it seems like they don't have the, the read permission. Um, so on top of these documents, we, we have a background work task, uh, which runs through these, these initial, like that store the actual relationships between the nodes and builds up a second state document for each node, which lists all of the permissions that are inherited um, for a given permission. So here, um, the only change for this graph, because it's so simple, is that 
um, the me now appears in the read in the read document. So now we can query the read document and see that that user has, in fact has that permission. This this is sort of just an iterative process over all of the documents. Uh, we have Raven indexes which identify uh, which nodes need to be updated as uh, new changes come into the graph. Um, and so basically that, that, that will build up the, uh, in this case, we've got the right, the original uh, document for the right permission. We build a state document for the right permission, which will initially, uh, sorry, I should say the read permission. We've got the original document. We build the initial state document, which will just have the right permission in it. Uh, the right document will have just the me permission in. Then our index worker will go over this and see that read is connected to write, and write has this extra permission in that we don't have in the read state document, and so it'll insert that into the read state document. And it just iteratively builds the state documents until the graph is settled and there's no more changes. Um, so, yeah, and so then you can query it just by checking whether the me uh, sort of pseudo permission appears in the, the set. Um, so this obviously has a number of issues. Um, the, the main one is that this worker process can take a long time uh, and so there's a period of time where permissions aren't quite in sync. Um, it hasn't been a, a huge problem uh, but, but there certainly are issues and, and to address that what we've had to do is build a sort of cached uh, permission graph in process that updates in, in parallel with the permission graph that's stored in Raven, um, which uh, sort of amel ameliorates some of those problems, uh, but still, if there's sort of the other processes we've got, uh, you know, running, don't necessarily have those permission updates, so there's still issues there. Um, uh, the first point there is the, s the state documents can get very large. Basically, the nodes, that, the sort of, the, the permissions at the very end of the paths end up with everything all the way up. Um, we sort of worked around that by introducing intermediate groups. Um, so certain nodes sort of, if you imagine the users are sort of down the bottom and the end permissions are up the top, we, we mark certain nodes in the middle as group nodes. Then we record which users belong to which groups and which groups have which permissions, which sort of reduces what we need to store in the middle of the graph. And then see where the intersect, if there's an intersection between whether you know a user belongs in a group that has that permission, and do the permission check that way. Um, but yeah, we still have we still have problems where occasionally there's permissions take a short while to catch up after some changes have been made, which means the user may not see, you know, something they should be able to see, or vice versa. It's probably worse. Um, so the obvious solution to this now is to just use a graph database, where we can store the permission graph as a graph uh, instead of trying to mash it into a uh, document store. Um, so that's that's what we're working on at the moment, uh, and that's why we're introducing Neo4j. Um, and so this Neo4j does exactly that. Uh, instead of having documents uh, storing sort of a bag of properties, you have um, nodes in a graph and relationships in a graph connecting them. Uh, the nodes can have types or labels. Um, so we have permissions and users and groups. Um, and the relationships can have types. We only use one type at the moment, which is has permission, um, which is basically just the graph you saw before. Um, so the advantages are numerous. Um, you get transactional updates. So as soon as you insert a new relationship into the graph, you next the next query you make will show show that has that uh, update reflected in what permissions you have. Um, we no longer need to calculate the intermediate state in the state graph. Um, we're hoping it's faster. It hasn't been proven yet. It's still being uh, implemented, uh, and and importantly, it's a lot simpler as well. So th this background worker task that scanned over the permission uh, nodes and built up the state documents uh, is a relatively complex piece of code uh, and doing stuff in Raven that we probably shouldn't be doing. Um, so so this is quite nice. Um, th th there is one caveat, uh, which is that we do need to send some data still back into Raven. Uh, we, we use permissions in, in two main ways. One is that each uh, API endpoint can be decorated with a, a requires permission attribute, which indicates that, that in order to access that endpoint, you have to have a certain permission. We also use it though uh, in our search results. So 
most users in the system have access to search for various things, for the, the media library and various things. In, the, in those search results, we only want to return results that you actually have access to. Um, but in order to do the search, we want to make use of Raven's indexes. So we need to insert the, or some form of permission information into the Raven indexes as well. Uh, and that was the arrow, if you remember way back when, uh, going back from Neo4j into Raven uh, that Andrew spoke about earlier in the talk. But that's sort of more one point. Uh, one very nice thing I'll just finish on is that it also gives us the ability to do uh, visualizations. This is built into Neo4j's um, uh, web client uh, that you can use to play around with the graph database. And so this is actually just an example of our actual permission data um, from a test database. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but this, each node is a permission. Um, they're not labelled, but so they have the, the GUIDs and the roles. Um, and the arrows are the has permissions relationship. Um, so there's sort of lots of, yeah, you kind of get an, get an idea of it. And it's quite nice for debugging to see if things are doing what you expect. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the motivation behind why we're moving to the FJ. Are there any questions? Does that have some query language? Uh, yeah, it does. So we've only just started using it. It seems like it's gone through a few iterations. The, the earlier iterations had a query language called Gremlin, which seems to be a, a general uh, graph query language where you define a traversal of a graph. So you want to start at a particular node and then follow certain paths. The new, the newer version, so version two, I think they introduced it, has a language called Cipher, which um, is quite declarative. You um, you basically can match nodes on certain properties like a label or a, a, a property that the node has. Uh, and I didn't, I don't have any examples of the syntax, but the, the syntax is sort of, you know, a bracketed node with parameters to match the node on, and then just ASCII arrow, which represents a relationship. You can have an arrowhead indicate the direction of the relationship um, and proper like a relationship type for instance um, so but you basically end up with these queries that look kind of like the graph that skeleton that you want to match um, and you can pull the results out from that so that's quite nice um, yeah uh, how do you go about um, if you want to do execute a query for example and get all of the um, people whose name is John yep. who It's, it's all the people who's. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So if, you to, um, if you wanted to say execute a query on your database, get all the. And you know, I don't know what you've got, what the identities are that you're yep. giving permissions to, the state of the customer record. Yep. Um, give me all the customers. Oh, so, yeah, oh, I so see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who I have permission to read. Can yeah. You They, they, they would be, we would have to chain that together. To, in order to do that efficiently, um, that is sort of not a need we have, so we haven't really considered it, I guess. Um, except for, it, it ties in a little bit with the searching where we have to project some data back into the Raven database. Um, so we could do something similar to that. Um, otherwise, it, it would probably be, you, you really build up the graph based on the queries you want to make. Um, so the, the design of the permission graph is really that we have now is based on the kind of permission queries we need to do. But in that case, you would probably also introduce that name property, say, into the permission graph itself somehow with a separate relationship. And then you could just do that direct query on that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Have you come across the need or have you thought about uh, the need of uh, explicitly denying access to a permission? Uh, if it, at some point, probably in your uh, new route to the permission, sometimes you would uh, probably need a specific scenario that goes through the same route, but for a specific uh, entity that, no, for this one, explicitly deny access. Yeah, I can see your point. Um, we, we haven't had that need either, but that would be quite simple to add just by adding uh, an additional relationship saying uh, this, this user does not have this permission, um, which you could check first. Yeah. Yeah, by, by default, no one has access to anything. Sorry, yeah, yeah so I should make that, that point too. Yeah. yeah, that's how we avoid denies right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think ever since I started 
computing being in programming. I've been I've pretty well written a user roles permission system about every two or three years. <laughs> um, so what was it like doing it in Neo4j compared to doing it in all the other ones you've probably done in the past as well? Uh, I haven't actually had that much experience with it. My previous job was uh, building a, a network a game client stack, which didn't, didn't, didn't have need for that. But um, uh, I, I can compare it between the, the Raven system and, and what I've just done with an EFJ, um, and it was far simpler. Um, it, it, the, the, the biggest, uh, the sort of the thing that's taken the most time in implementing this was understanding the existing uh, Raven implementation of it. Um, but the neo 4 system, sort of, one, the, it, it, because there's a much, you know, the, 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 the graph is just the graph. I get what you mean, because the um, Raven thing, as soon as you were describing it, sounded like a smell of horror. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, which, ba which basically, <laughs> you know, it's sort of there for, for historical reasons. But, yeah, it wasn't wasn't a good solution. So, um, yeah, it, it just, you know, what, what we actually need is a permission graph, and now what we have is a... A, a, a graph database to store that graph and, and it, you know, there's a one-to-one -one match between the two. So, yeah, I would say it's, yeah, a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And to add to that, Neo4j is the third iteration of permissions. <laughs> Ray Raven's the second. Yeah. What was the first? The first was much simpler. That was, I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was my sequel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk later. <laughs> yep. What's the information you're actually projecting into a Raven DB to allow you to do? Uh, oh, so bloom filters is something we're considering f to introduce along with with these changes now. Um, the existing the existing solution is um, the the kind of groups. When I was talking about the state documents end up with too much information in them, we introduce these intermediate groups. Um, what we project is uh, so we know which permission we need to see these documents. So when we build the index, we find out which groups have that permission, and we store that in the index. And then we make the query, we find out which groups a user belongs to, and send that with the query and ensure there's some intersection there. Yeah. So, but yeah, we're, we're looking at moving to a Bloom filter to yeah simplify that. At the moment, we've got to pick which which nodes we want to turn into groups, basically, which is a bit, a bit of a manual task. So, yeah. All right. I think it's uh, Baz up next if we're... Yeah, next up is Baz, he's going to talk about our client side things. Um, there you go. Uh, how do we make a full screen? F? Uh, F. F. Oh, no. Is it? No. <laughs> oh, it's gone full screen here. That's why I'm up here. Is or uh, now we need to move it. Yeah. Can you just stay in the window? Oh, I think that it's... Uh, Move it over there. Sorry, this is our front-end guy. Had to be front-end <laughs> presentation. <laughs> oh, wait. There we go. Okay, so I'm mostly going to be talking about the frameworks that we have in our front-end. The give you a few tips along the way, uh, if you're going to be working with these frameworks. So we're using TypeScript as a front-end scripting language instead of JavaScript. It's basically just JavaScript with types and the future JavaScript. And when I say the future JavaScript, I basically mean it has classes and lambdas, uh, which means that if you're familiar with the concept of MVC, your controllers can be just classes and not something that you make out of functions. Um, <laughs> and um, yes, and, uh, with, with lambdas, what it does is that it, it really it removes the function keyword. For a, for a functional language, you seem to be writing the word function quite a lot in raw JavaScript, and with TypeScript, you don't need to do that. You can use the lambda syntax. Uh, and it also lexically scopes this. For those that are familiar with JavaScript and the tortures of this, uh, TypeScript helps you a bit there. And it has types. So that's it's a feature of JavaScript, and it has types. And what types give you is discoverability. You know at this point that this particular item over here, which is file, has these members on it, and you know for sure that it has these members on it. This is not based on some random code analysis that something like Lee Sharper did that, hmm, I know that this name is in some JavaScript file. I think you might have that or the member of this particular variable. So this is actual proper code completion if you're familiar from other static languages. Um, it gives you refactoring support, and again, the refactoring is reliable. It's not going to be 
I think this variable is that variable of type. So maybe if you rename this, maybe you want to rename that. Um, and this code completion and uh, refactoring is is not just for our client side TypeScript. It also extends from the server to our type client side TypeScript. In that we generate DTOs, which is basically the data transfer objects between the server and the client as interfaces in TypeScript. Which means um, so a, a, in addition to this particular data structure, well, what particular data structure we're going to be passing, we also generate the services. So you never need to actually make an XHR call yourself. It, these functions will be generated for you in our code base. Um, which means that someone's alarm is going off. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry. So for making you awkward, whoever that was. Uh, <laughs> So the create revision function uh, basically is generated. So the, the members of that are defined. It's going to be reliable. It's going to be type safe. You refactor your backend. Your client side code is automatically going to change, and you're going to get compiler errors, which is exactly what is happening over here. We modified assets to be terse time items because it can be assets or products, and our client side code gave us an error that this particular thing no longer has an asset ID. It has an ID. Refactor it. Uh, now, if you want to use TypeScript in your projects, you don't have, it's not an all or nothing proposition. You don't need to delete all your JavaScript code and go with TypeScript. You can introduce it partially. Just rename your JavaScript file to a TypeScript file, and it's most probably going to say that it's bad. You haven't declared your variables. You haven't, uh, you've assigned something to a string, and then you've tried to assign it to a number. And that's just the compiler helping you. Don't swear at it. Uh, you can use JavaScript code from TypeScript quite easily as well. In fact, there's a bunch of these definitions. Basically, you declare what is the ambient environment in which your TypeScript is going to be running. For example, for jQuery, there's the dollar variable, which has a number of members on it. So you bring in the jQuery definition, and it knows that, OK, so there's, if you're using dollar, it, 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 it can be a selector. It has these members on it, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and this, this repository is actually becoming the de facto repository for all client-side uh, type definitions. So WebStorm uses it for, even if you're using JavaScript, Node.js, Mocha, this is the definition file that you'll be using. If you're going to be using Flow, which is the statically typed language for from Facebook, which is syntax compatible with TypeScript. And there's a reason why all of these languages, and the next version of Angular is going to be written in AdScript, which is also another version of typed JavaScript. The reason why all of these are actually compatible with TypeScript is mostly because, A, because of this. And secondly, because TypeScript itself is compatible with the type annotations that were introduced with ECMAScript 4, which never made it off the shelf. Uh, and uh, a couple of tips that I have is use require.js. The reason why this will help you is it will allow you to compile your TypeScript for the client side with require.js as well as with the AMD module pattern, for those that are familiar, as well as for the server with common.js. If you have questions about these, you are free to ask them at the end of this talk. The next client-side technology that I'm going to be talking about is AngularJS. Um, the main reason why you went with AngularJS as compared to one its alternatives is uh, because it's full stack. We had knockout in our previous project, uh, which meant that for something like history, we had to use history.js and boost up a bunch of stuff. With AngularJS is full stack, just bring it in, start using it. This is the point where we were making our decision. We're really glad that we went with AngularJS at that point because everything else feels like the lonely island. Um, so another great thing about TypeScript, about AngularJS, is that it works really well with TypeScript. It really doesn't impose any restrictions on what you're going to be using as your model. I showed you the controller, which is just a simple class. Um, AngularJS is great for TypeScript. So th this is that same template uh, introduced over here as well. So we have these templates in our wiki and anybody who wants to create a new controller, he just copies this file into a new folder. If he's, and the reason why we have them in the wiki is because you can use Visual Studio, Sublime Text, whatever you want to use. You make your own templates. Uh, and the services are even simpler. It's just a simple class. Uh, for those that are familiar with AngularJS, um, the dollar inject is actually right next to the constructor, which means, which means that they really get out of sync. So our code works with minification as well, and it doesn't look ugly, which it does sometimes with the uh, raw JavaScript English, yes. We don't absolutely love it. We're not fanboys of English, yes. The DI is good, but it's actually not that required. 
Um, the reason why we have to use DI, the Angular's dependency injection, is because to get stuff, get access to stuff like the scope or its own services like timeout, etc. You need to use its DI mechanism, which means that uh, you have required JS as well as Angular's DI within your application. Uh, this is being fixed in the next version of Angular anyways. They're going to go with the standard ECMAScript 6 syntax, uh, which brings me to Edscript, which is the next version of, uh, which is the language in which the next version of AngularJS is going to be written in. It is type compatible, it is um, compilation compatible with TypeScript. So this is basically valid TypeScript code as well as valid uh, Edscript code. And just a little tip to, to make your time here worthwhile. Um, <laughs> if to manage links within your application, you can use something like this, which is what we use, which is just a simple JavaScript object, which has a number of member functions on it. These member functions are just lambdas, which is another great thing about TypeScript. What this allows, uh, allows you to do is if you expose this particular entire DTO, uh, sorry, this entire uh, JavaScript object as a member called link to on the root scope, within your HTML, you can just simply do uh, link to dot job dot edit catalog and blah blah blah. So this makes your URLs within your entire application consistent. And we actually use the same uh, JavaScript object for configuration as well, configuring the routes within our application. So it never goes out of sync. Um, and here's another tip for because we drive everything within our HTML from our controllers at every single previous job. Inevitably, at some point in the bug, you like uh, I have to click ten times just to get to the bug. You can mostly do those things directly from the controller if you write your controllers properly with AngularJS. Okay, so we're using TypeScript, we're using AngularJS. Uh, we're using SAS for our CSS. Uh, we did evaluate other options. At that point, Stylus was not that up to date, and we didn't like the functional in the sense of uh, non imperative functional. <laughs> functional is good, but lack of imperative ability made less not such a good option at that point. So we went with SAS, plus um, yeah, a number of other community members also went with the same decision. So to compile our SAS to CSS, our TypeScript to JavaScript, and then compiling, compile, uh, merging all these JavaScript files and these CSS files into a single minified one and sending that to the client, that's managed by Grunt. It does that on our build server as well as at uh, dev time, it watches your files whenever you make a modification and it regenerates the CSS and JavaScript so you can just, by the time you modif make your modification, save it, open your, go to your browser tab and F5 it, it's mostly ready. Or you can have a sip of your coffee if it's not. Um, one tip that we have with Grunt is that if you're going to be using it, check in your node underscore modules folder. For those that are familiar with Node.js, this is where the node modules that your application depends on our stored in. Um, you could put all the configuration that of, you could put the configuration of all the modules that your application depends upon in a package.json and do a simple npm install and it will fetch those for you. But it will be a problem if npm is down. It will be a time consuming task for every new dev machine. It will be a time consuming task on the build server. Just check it in and not worry about it. Plus the guy who checks it in gets the greatest number of code line changes in the repository. So that's good. <laughs> Throw your team lead off. Uh, that's Nick, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Mocha is what we use for our front-end testing. Uh, the reason, the, the two main options were Mocha and Jasmine when we evaluated it, they still are. The reason why we went with Mocha is because of its excellent support for async, at, uh, async tests. And if you're going to be writing JavaScript, it's always going to be async. It's always single threaded on the server as well as on the client. So this is a sample spec in Mocha. We have a simple test over here. And what makes this particular test async is the fact that we're going to be returning a promise. So if you want to learn more about promises, talk to me afterwards or ask me a quick question if you have it, if you can manage to ask it from this code sample. Um, so this entire test is going to fail if this any part of this promise chain fails or this test is going to succeed if it succeeds. Mocha does it silently, which is excellent. AngularJS loves promises as well, so it's uh, really just extremely simple to merge together. Um, a couple of other tips that we have over here is that isolate your create functions, your um, get functions, and your expectation functions. 
just because you're going to be using them in a bunch of functions and you can do more tests that way and your test spec looks cleaner. And so if, if you want to use Mocha, so we, we looked at the built-in tools that come with Angular like Karma and now Protected and etc. We don't actually really need something like that. We don't need something that heavy and we didn't want to manage, because once you do that, you need to manage the versions between the two as well and keep them in sync. Otherwise, Karma doesn't like the current version of Angular you have and, it's, and stuff like that. Um, what we've done is we've abstracted away the Angular side of our client side code. So all of our HTTP services are generated, which I already mentioned, um, which means that the, their only dependency is on $HTTP. So we can mock out a <coughs> physical $HTTP with the request NPM package. And so what we're doing with our mocha tests is we're testing everything from the client side JavaScript up to the backend, which means that if we refact, so there, there are going to be actual HTTP requests to the server in our mocha tests. Uh, the, way, the reason why we did this is this ensures that if we have an issue, is that issue in the backend or in the front, front end client side code? Um, it, it was really important when we were making massive changes. Plus it allows, allowed Andrew to completely rewrite the backend and whenever he does a refactor, which is probably what he's going to be doing, doing with stranding as well, uh, he can just run the mock test and if they work, he knows that he hasn't broken anything in the backend. And the client side is going to be completely happy with this. So this particular code segment is going to be generated. All that it depends upon from Angular is something like $HTTP, the promise library queue, something like the timeout service or whatever. These can be mocked out quite easily in Node.js and that's what we've done. Uh, one little tip is store your common logins in a simple JavaScript object. These are your test logins. I've changed the password for these test logins as well, although you could probably guess the actual one as well. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So any questions? You can talk to me afterwards as well. Okay, that's it. Yep, go for it. Oh. <coughs> you said you used uh, Grunt to minify and bundle your uh, resources. Yep. Resources. Uh, how do you manage this between development environment and uh, production? So we have um, within our industrial HTML, which is the main page that you serve when you're making a single page application which is actually going to bring in all the, everything else. Um, we have a switch there that if it is a debug build or a release build, if it's a release build, then it just requests the minified, CS, mini, minified versions within an include. Now these minified versions are going to be generated from Grunt. If it's not, then it's going to simply make a required JS call with the data dash main and require the main JS file and that's going to bring in other files. So you get, in your Chrome debug tools, you get all the JS files, you get all the CSS files, etc. Opinions. Okay. Okay. Stuff, yes. Sorry, I'll just take a picture of everyone. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> now I have to be quick because there's pizza coming. <laughs> cool. All right. I introduced myself before. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about how sort of our development workflow. It's a bit softer. Um, uh, we've been working with feature branches for a while, and just uh, quite recently we started going down a, a, a pull request um, kind of workflow, um, and I'll dig into that. So uh, about two months ago, um, just over two months ago, we caught up with some guys back there, uh, Adam and Michael, um, who recommended approach to us um, in a, a much longer, more detailed discussion. Um, so two months has passed now, and I want to sort of give a, like a reflection on this as well. Uh, we've closed about 120 pull requests. There's maybe eight open, like at the end of the day today. Um, so how are we doing it? Um, we were using feature branches earlier. We would branch off of master when we were developing a new feature. We would either throw the whole dev team at it or some of us, depending on who needed it and when and why. Um, and uh, yeah, prior to this workflow, it was a little bit, um, yeah, cowboyish. Everyone just first one to push gets to trigger the build server. Often it was Baz. Um, and then, yeah, if, if someone else happened to fetch at that time, uh, for whatever reason, it may be in a bad state. Um, just 
just by the nature of our build server taking a few minutes to um, to do the the build and the tests. Um, so the new approach is um, we branch off on a feature branch, and then uh, each developer, typically one person per pull request, has a isolated thing to work on. Um, uh, the developer gets to create the pull request whenever they like. They can create it at the start or when they think they're ready for someone to review it. If they create it early or whatever point, you can do um, tagging through the GitHub UI. So we're using GitHub to help us with this. Um, and we were using GitHub before this as well. Uh, and Team City helps with this. Um, the other how part of this that I want to introduce here is the, um, the pull requests are asynchronous. It, um, and, and it is a little bit of a, well, it's asynchronous in terms of who you want to review it. Uh, you don't need to go and interrupt someone to say, hey, can you please review my pull request? Though, if you do need to, that's okay as well. Um, but it's really, hey, when, when you're ready, have a look at it. Okay, so that's the introduction. Um, here are the, the GitHub tags that I alluded to. Um, we basically, we had three up until today, and then I introduced a fourth one, which is in progress. Uh, LGTM means looks good to me. Um, and yeah, so it's either you, you flag it ready for review and you tag someone. Um, if you just mention their name in GitHub, uh, they'll get an email notification. Or, and we've got other sort of configuration tools plugged into this. Sorry, we've got other services plugged into this to help deliver notifications like our team chat Slack. So certain messages come out of GitHub um, and, and, other, and our other services like Team City or Octopus that alert us. Uh, and then, yeah, just Team City is building these pull requests. So um, I'll talk about the why first, and this way I'll stay on track. Uh, why? I touched on this. Adam and Mike recommended it to us. Uh, but the, the reason we jumped on board quickly with this was um, we wanted more code reviews. We were struggling to do code reviews in a sort of consistent and a frequent manner. I don't know. It's possibly the case in lots of places. Um, and from the code reviews, we were trying to improve our code quality. Um, just by having another set of eyes on the code earlier. And, and, and that leads to catching bugs earlier as well. Um, and we also wanted to share knowledge as well. Um, being a small dev team, um, and especially if we're working on a few things, it's quite easy to, to develop little silos of, hey, just this person's worked on this. Uh, at least with a code review, uh, uh, at least one other person has seen some of this stuff. Um, so here's an example of a bug we caught. Um, lucky he's left. Um, in this case, this was the the this was the code I was reviewing. Uh, it was quite nested in a lot of changes in this one. Just the nature of this change meant that there was five thousand additions. It was mostly config and packages changes, uh, and some deletions as well. But there was a if you could see this here, there's a throw. There's a deliberate throw left in some code. Um, this is because we were changing our logging system and we wanted to see that it was actually going to catch an exception and not try to have to, you know, actually cause a real exception in the app. Um, but yeah, this, at the time, this landed on my desk, this needed to be reviewed. Uh, sorry, this was still in there. So uh, if, if there was a few issues, you just make some comments or you just tap the person on your shoulder and say, I think you left some code in commit. Um, they either amend that commit because it's your own branch, you can force push over it quite easy knowing there's not going to be a problem, or just have another commit that uh, corrects the thing. And then, because uh, th this, this the build server would not have caught. This is not, this is a runtime exception. Uh, and none of our tests would have caught this as well, because we're not testing at, th this is like right at the, the up, at most top level of, of hosting our application. Yeah, at the service level. Um, so there's no test that, mm, actually, yeah, there was some weird behavior if this went in. Okay, so the, the wins that I can talk about already is the build server is far more often in a green state. Um, this way, this allowed each developer to rely more on the, the, the build server. Um, so with Team City, we just set up a few more agents now that we had a few more builds happening. So now you can actually, if, if you know your pull request is not ready, you can push more often um, and tr push somewhere where a build will be triggered and you can sort of lean on the build server to help detect things. So in our code base, um, there's a bunch of tests that will run uh, on the build server, and some tests that you don't want to run too often on your dev uh, locally while you're working on something. So it'll capture that well before it gets um, before it bothers anyone else. I touched on the knowledge sharing already and the silos, reducing that, um, and just 
it's an opportunity to have sort of constructive feedback chats as well. Like, hey, um, I, I think you could do this a little bit better. Or, oh, no, we, we already kind of solved this problem here. Uh, this is better. Or, um, yeah, things like that. Um, yeah, and I've already mentioned the bugs. OK, so there's a, the testing part of this I've also already mentioned. But basically, our unit in integration tests run on TeamCity this way. Um, we have another integration point with our bug tracker um, where particular commits, if they're flagged correctly, can update the actual bug. So you don't even have to mark the bug as finished. We'll have a, um, a suffix on the end of a, a, um, a code commit check-in message. Um, and it will just update um, our bug tracker with the build where this bug is fixed. Um, so that helps the testing team as well know that, oh, is this actually, I know the developer, this way the developer didn't have to mark it as fixed. Uh, the, the pipeline did that. Uh, and then we, then we just have to check that, oh, is this build released into one of our testing or staging environments and we're good to go. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit of what the uh, the build city, sorry, the team city build integration looks like in terms of GitHub. It says it just adds comments. Hey, I built this thing. It took this long. These are the tests I run, and it was successful, or it failed. Uh, and then for the person reviewing the pull request, they get the nice green button already when we know that the um, the code in this pull request merges against the branch that they forked off of, plus. The, the report from Team City is there as well. So you don't have to go and read the success. If this is all green, it'll, you're good to go. This will be yellow if it's building. It'll, as soon as Team City kicks off a build, it'll alert and say, hey, you may want to hold off. The message basically, hold off merging this or merge with caution. There's a build in progress. Um, so that way you could, um, yeah, that way you can either decide to review it now or review it later. Um, now, the Another thing we were trying to, we bundled in with this sort of, this recent change to our our team workflow is uh, the just the nature of our features because our features are really, our features get a little bit complicated because they're cross customer. So we only have one, this is one code base, this is one app, all of our customers use this. Um, so uh, with the best intentions of a feature planned out typically for a single customer with some consideration for the others, um, it's only really, yeah, only really once we're in the nitty gritty do we really work out what, yeah, what it really means to deliver it. So what we've bundled into this pull request uh, mechanism that helps our testing team and everyone stay in the loop is we basically have markdown files. Um, there's not many of them. They basically form a wiki of the the core the core workflow of a particular feature. Hey, when you do this, this is the kinds of things to expect. The the simplest listing of this is this is the status that it needs to be in because our our application is really about a workflow and managing statuses of things so we're doing as with all sort of documentation we're doing our best to keep this up to date but at least at the time of development at the time of reviewing a pull request uh, it's one thing we're looking for and that way at the time of testing which is similar time frame the testers can have a look at this and go oh okay oh no they, they said this thing is this what they meant the code to do and the codes are not doing it um, or something like that. And then, yeah, we can always give the feedback of, hey, you missed, oh, I see you changed this. I, I, I clearly see that this status variable changed when this thing happens. And in our code base, that's usually quite easy to see. There's an event and you'll, you'll see a status change in the handling of that event or like a permission change. Um, you'll see those lines, uh, but you won't see an update in the documentation. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and th there's just a quick example. It's just, it's just, Using clicks, this is the status. Um, yeah. Any questions? We can take other questions as well. Doesn't have to be for this section. I know there's pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to me later then. Uh, yep. Okay. So um, there is pizza here. What <laughs> I've done is we put half of it out on the desk out there. So feel free to, if you're really hot in here, get out and get out there. And I'll put half of it on the kitchen in the kitchen up the back there. Um, we're going to need a bit of space to move around here, so I'm going to try something new tonight. All you guys in the black chairs, when you get up, pick up your chair, fold it up, and put it either against that wall or that wall. Let's see how that goes. Good luck.